grateful for Linda's. <laughs> I preached at uh, Lantana and Crossville for about eight and a half years, and they had no Linda's in their auditorium. Oh Absolutely none. And when the power went off, and it did more than once, it was as dark as a cave, just about it. I kept a flashlight under the podium, and more than once I had to drag it out and lay it down and read and continue to preach. But this doesn't do a thing. I can't tell much difference with the lights on and the lights off. So that's something to be thankful for this morning. <clears throat> We're doing an overview of the book of 1 Corinthians. Not a verse by verse, but just sort of an overview, looking at some of the things that the Apostle Paul had to say to the church at Corinth. We looked at chapter 12 last time I was here. And we dealt with the nine spiritual gifts, the miraculous gifts. Trying to explain a little bit about what, what they were and how they were used and why they were given. Because you didn't have revelation in its completeness. You had inspiration in an inspired man. And it was being revealed <clears throat> during that particular time. Chapter 13 is going to give us a, a little more added to that. And I've entitled the lesson, uh, The More Excellent Way. Because he ended in chapter 12, in verse 31, he said, Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet shall I unto you a more excellent way. You've got these miraculous gifts, and they were fussing over them and abusing them, and they didn't love each other the way they should, and we'll notice that just more when we get toward the end of our study of 1 Corinthians, but just going back and seeing sort of the problem at Corinth, Chapter 1 was division. I will follow, I will follow. That, that's a lack of love. Uh, you have in chapter 6, there were brothers taking brothers to law. That, that's a love problem. Chapter 7, there were some abuses in regard, well, chapter 5, before we get there, there was a guy living with his father's wife, and they were puffed up. They had a guy among them that was in sin, and they didn't love him enough to deal with it. You know, love sometimes has to deal with things, doesn't it? And then uh, you had several things about marriage that was given in chapter 7. In chapter 11, they were making a common meal out of the Lord's Supper, and the rich and affluent were enjoying it and excluding the others. That's, that's a problem with love. And now he's going to deal with love here. And then chapter 14, there's the abuse of the spiritual gifts again, and he's going to show them how to regulate that, and that would be with love. And then uh, chapter 15, about uh, resurrection and also being faithful, being steadfast, unmovable. That, that's, that's the problem with love. If you're not faithful to the Lord, it's because you don't love Him the way you should. And then chapter 16, he, he's going to talk about giving, among other things. And we don't give as we should if we don't love the Lord. So love all the way through this book. So I'm showing you a more excellent way. Now watch how he starts off. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not... Charity. King James uses the word charity. The New King James says love. We know what we're talking about. So we're going to uh, substitute the word charity for love because it, it's the same thing. If it have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. All right? Well, we, we've just spent some time talking about tongues in chapter 12. That was one of the miraculous gifts. And then he ended uh, chapter 12, verse 30. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Well, rhetorical questions. The answer is no. Covet earnest of the best gifts. I'm showing you a better way. Now let's talk about that better way. The more excellent way. It's love. And he deals with it here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Tongues are languages. In Acts chapter 2, every man heard him speak in his own language where he was born. His own tongue where he was born. What language do you speak? What's your native tongue? What's your native language? Same thing. I'm saying the same thing. And you would answer back and say, English is my native tongue or my native language. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Evidently, the idea here is all of them. You know, they were sort of puffed up sometimes because, well, I can speak this language or I can speak this language. Suppose I can speak all of them. Every one of them. How many of them are there? Well, I don't know. There's over 700 in Africa. Where did they come from? Go back to the book of Genesis. Every man spoke the same language. And they were going to build this tower to heaven. And God says, no, you're not either. And he confused the languages. 
You know, languages were not invented by cavemen who grunted and ooh and odd and come up with a language. Language came from God. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. He gave them a language and then He communicated with them through that language. He said, of every tree of the garden, you can freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. You think they understood that? Yeah. What does thou shalt not mean? It means what it means today. Same thing. Don't do it. They understood exactly what it meant. So God has used language. So if I can speak every tongue, any language, every language in the world, and even go a step beyond that, he gives two categories. Languages here on earth and languages in heaven. The angels communicate with each other. The angels talk with God. What language do they use? Well, we're Americans. We probably would say English. <laughs> but uh, not necessarily. I don't know what language the angels. Maybe they've got their own language that's nothing to do with ours. When God sent angels from heaven to earth to talk, he talked to them in the language that they could understand it. Abraham understood what they were saying. Lot understood what they were saying. Uh, Mary understood. Matthew 1, Elizabeth understood when the angel talked to her. So they used languages. So if I can speak every language on earth and even speak heavenly languages that probably nobody can speak and I didn't have love, it would profit me nothing. I would be like sounding brass or tingling cymbal. It would just it would mean nothing. It would be of no advantage. In the next few verses, as he talks about love, and we we look at this passage, and we look at it, but there's about, uh, about ten ingredients that he gives here of love. Love is patient. He says it suffers long. Kindness describes love. He says it is kind. Generosity describes love. It envieth not. Humility describes <coughs> love. It vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Boy, the Corinthians needed that one, didn't they? They were puffed up many times. Uh, courtesy is, describes love. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. Unselfishness seeketh not her own. For God so loved the world that he gave his own begotten Son. There's love. Jesus loved us so much, he willingly humbled himself and died that horrible death on the cross. There's, there's love. Unselfish. Love can be described as having a good temper. It's not easily provoked. Love can be described as guileless. That is, no, having no guile. It, it thinketh no evil. There's no hypocrisy there. Love can be thought, uh, thought of as the word sincerity. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. And then the word tolerance describes love. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So he's going to talk about the greatness of love and that love is permanent. You're going to see in this chapter that there are some things that are temporary and there are some things that are permanent. Now let's, let's see if we can unfold some of this and have a better understanding of it. He went on and said that if he had the gift of prophecy, now again, you've got to look at the context. You go back to chapter 12, tongues is a miraculous gift. Prophecy was a miraculous gift. These are miraculous gifts that are mentioned, and he's still talking about that, showing them a more excellent way. Uh, if he had faith, what kind of faith? Miraculous faith. What kind of faith is it? It's a faith that you can say to this mountain, be gone, and it would be. That's a miracle. You, you can't pray a mountain uh, away, but... Uh, the whole idea about faith moving mountains, if you had miraculous faith in the first century, that was a miracle. Certain things could be done. But if you had all that and didn't have love, what would it prompt you? And even the benevolent aspect of it, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Lots of folks gave some to feed the poor. Barnabas gave some of his land and others gave some. But give it all, everything you got. And uh, give your body to be burned. In sacrifice to God. In other words, you're going to be faithful to God, uh, the idea of serving Him, but you didn't really have love. You didn't do it for the right reason. Then what would it profit you? Love suffers long, it's kind, 
It follows not itself. We've talked about some of those words there. Bears all things, believes all things. It never fails. Verse 8, love will never fail. The love of God will never fail. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. The love of Christ will never fail. And the church is in great need all around the world of having more love for their fellow man and for the lost souls of men and women. So love is never going to fail. But now watch verse 8. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now what are you talking about, Paul? Are you saying that the prophecies that are in the Bible, that Jesus is going to come back and all the dead is going to be resurrected, that's not going to happen? That's, that's what we mean when we say a prophecy failed. And that the wicked are going to hell and the righteous are going to heaven. That was a prophecy that was made. So we're saying that's not going to happen? No. Again, look at the context. What kind of prophecies? Miraculous prophecy. Chapter 12. Having the gift of prophecy to be able to teach or preach or foretell future events or tell people what the Word of God says when you don't have a copy of the Word of God. God revealed it to you. That's the kind of prophecy. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Is he saying there's coming a time we won't be able to talk? No. What kind of tongues? Tongues are languages. There's, there's coming a time that there'll be no languages? No. This is miraculous tongues. The, the ability to speak a language that you haven't studied. One of these days, that's going to stop, Paul says. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Is there coming a time that we won't know anything? That's not what I'm saying. What kind of knowledge? Miraculous knowledge. Notice those three words that are mentioned there in that particular verse. Fail, cease, vanish away. What does that suggest as you think about it? it suggests they're temporary. They're not permanent. If it's going to fail, if it's going to cease, if it's going to vanish away, then it's, it's temporary. Our body, our health is going to fail, it's going to cease, it's going to vanish away. But we'll be given an incorruptible body one day. That one won't fail or cease or vanish away. That one will last forever. So we've got to look at this in its context and see what's going on. These things are going to be done away with. There's coming a time when these miraculous gifts that were mentioned in chapter 12 are going to be done away with. They're not permanent. They're temporary. Now, he goes on in verse 9, and he says, We know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part should be done away. Now notice, we know in part and we prophesy in part. Our knowledge of the revelation of God is partial. I know this because the Apostle Paul told me that. I don't have a Bible to read, but a prophet said this, or somebody said this by inspiration. So we know in part and we prophesy in part. We teach some things but we don't have access to all the Word of God. But, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part should be done away. All right, something is coming. And if you'll notice, the Scripture didn't say, when He who is perfect has come. It's not talking about Jesus. It's not talking about heaven. When we get to that perfect place, then all these things will be done away. No, no. Something is coming, and it has reference to Revelation, and there's a contrast here between partial and full. There's a contrast between the, the babe and the mature. The adult, the child, and the man. And looking in the mirror is versus looking face to face. The contrast of seeing the full revelation being revealed that's given from God. Some things permanent, some things temporary. Love is permanent. The church is permanent. The Word of God is permanent. But what about these miraculous gifts? They're temporary. What about some of the offices? Do we have apostles in the church today? No. We did in the first century. We had apostles. But we don't have apostles today in the church. So you had some things then uh, that were permanent and some that were temporary. Uh, what's going to be done away? Prophecies. Tongues. Knowledge. Miraculous knowledge, these miraculous gifts are going to be done away. When are these miraculous gifts going to be done away? Well, he didn't tell us that on January the 8th, uh, the year, 
103 AD, they're all going to be gone away, but he did tell us when they're going to be done away with. Look, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away. When that which is perfect. Here, notice this contrast between knowing in part and having complete knowledge. Partial revelation versus full revelation. In James chapter 1, in verse 25, James said, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What did you say, James? Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. That's the word of God. So here, Paul says, when that which is perfect is time. And then James says, we can look into the perfect law of liberty. We're referring to the word of God. The word is often referred to that way. In Psalm uh, 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The idea there of that word perfect means complete. It means full or whole. What do you need other than God's Word? In 2 Peter chapter 1, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given. All things. Now, if I have every bell in the world, how many bells do you have? None. All things that pertain to life and godliness are right here. Well, what do we need that pertains to life and godliness that's not right here? Nothing. Nothing. The full, complete revelation is there. Earnestly contend for the faith, Jude 3, which was once delivered in the original language, once and for all delivered. Are we waiting for more revelation? We shouldn't be. We've got it all right here. There's not going to be another book coming. There's not going to be more. Because he's told us, this is it. This is it. That's all of it. Now there's a verse in Ephesians that's sort of a parallel verse to this verse here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want us to turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 and read this verse again. We're going to back up to verse 11. And the setting here, the context, he's talking about Paul, talking about the various things that were given, some, again, permanent, some temporary. He gave some to be apostles. Nobody was apostle who wasn't given that apostleship of the Lord. You couldn't run for the office of an apostle. You couldn't take it on yourself to be an apostle. The Lord selected the apostle. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, elders, and some teachers. Now, do we have preachers today? Yeah. Do we have elders today? Yes. Do we have teachers today? Yes. Do we have apostles today? No. Do we have inspired prophets today? No. No, we don't. Right? So he did give some of this and some of this and some of this. Now watch. Why did he do it? Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Perfecting. Making perfect. Complete. For the ministry or the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body. Now look at the time that's set up in verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, he's talking about this perfect man that's coming. Is that a sinless man? Is that that we're looking for men out here that don't ever make any mistakes? No, we're looking for that perfect man who is complete, who is whole. What does he have? He has every bit of the revelation. He has all things that pertain to life and godliness. There's not one thing that he don't hold in his hand that he needs. God has given him every bit of it. Now, another passage we use often in talking about the Scriptures ties in with this as well. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16, well, back up to even 15. Paul told young Timothy that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise in the salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
You and I have access to all of God's Word. Therefore, we're perfect. Are you sinless? Are you perfect in that sense? No. But you're perfect in the sense that you're complete. You have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You don't need anything else. You have the whole revelation as it has been revealed and given to us. So, you have these temporary miraculous gifts. They're going to be done away with when that which is perfect is come. When, when the full revelation is, is given, then these things that you have as partial will be done away. Now look at the contrasts that are here between the perfect and the imperfect. Verse 9, we know in part and we prophesy in part. We know in part and prophesy in part. If in part refers to revelation, then... So does verse 10. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. We have that which is in part, these miraculous gifts. We're going to have them until that which is perfect, the complete revelation. When it is come, that which is in part will be done away. And so you have a contrast between partial knowledge and complete knowledge. Not that I know everything or that you know everything, but that we have access to the full, complete, perfect will of God. Verse 11, he said, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Here is a contrast between the immature and the mature. Here's the child who doesn't have the strength and doesn't have the knowledge, but he one day is going to be a full-grown man. He's going to be complete, full-grown. Right now, you have the partial revelation and the inspired man. There's coming a time you're going to have the full-grown man. You're going to be able to look into the Word of God and read the Word of God. Then in verse 12, he said, Now we see through a glass darkly, the idea there's a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. You ever look at a an old antique dresser and look at the mirror that's on it. <laughs> Squinch your eyes and look and say, is that me in the mirror? There? That's, that's so hard. It's like a piece of glass that you would hold up and uh, look at maybe your reflection on a piece of metal or something. Their, their mirrors weren't very good back then. So you see yourself in this mirror that you really can't even tell it's you versus seeing somebody face to face. How clear is it when you're about that far? from somebody you love and you're looking right in their face. Then you can see. And there's the contrast between now, partial revelation, it's like looking in a mirror, a dark mirror, a, a, a terrible mirror. You can't see very good. But then, when we get full revelation, it'll be as if we're looking face to face at someone. There's the comparison between the two. Full or complete revelation when it's known and given. We see through a glass dark, then shall we see face to face and we'll know as we're known. And now by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. We must keep the whole context in mind. We must understand that there were some things permanent and some things temporary. The book of 1 Corinthians was written about 57 AD. Every book of the New Testament was completed by about 100 AD. So less than 50 years from the time Paul wrote this, that which is perfect would be here. They would have it. It would be the inspired Word of God. And they would make hand copies of the Word of God so others could have it, and others could have it, and others could have it. The perfect, complete Word of God. When we think about these temporary things, one of the best illustrations I ever heard on this was from an old pioneer preacher. And he used the illustration of these, these temporary things in the first century. He said, do you remember when this building was being built? On that particular occasion when he said that. He said, do you remember that they had these scaffolds built, the scaffolding out on the outside of the building? And, and the bricklayers would lay the brick up on top of it and the bricklayers would stand on that and, and do that rather than carrying one at a time on the ladder. 
And he'd walk, lay brick, walk over, lay, then they'd get down and move it over. He'd do it again. They'd hand the mud up and do that. Where? Where's this guy? To this building. Why isn't it still here? It's complete. It's complete. We don't need it. It was needed during that particular time, but after the building's finished, you take it down. You don't need it. The miraculous things were needed in the first century because you didn't have inspiration in the book. You had inspired men. The word was being confirmed by signs and miracles. Men were speaking in tongues that they hadn't studied. But then when it was all completed, and you have all things, that which is perfect this time, that which is in part, would be another way. As I said, by 100 A.D., they had access to all the Word of God. If you go back and study through uh, history, uh, all the apostles except the apostle John died violent deaths. And he died about that particular time. But you had some of them maybe alive while it was being put together. And then you, you look at the beautiful thing about this. In the first century when they were putting together the Word of God and, and writing these copies and getting it together. You still had some people alive, maybe, that the apostles had laid hands on. And they could say, by inspiration, this is it. This is the Bible. This is all about it. There's no more books coming. And that's being said by inspiration. So the Word of God wasn't just left to chance and for all we know there's a book or two missing. <laughs> no, it's, it's here. And there was this overlapping between the miracles, the miraculous age, and the non-miraculous coming to that point. So you had them verifying that, that that's it. That's it. And having access to it. In uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15, when we think about inspiration, Paul said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught. Now watch. Whether by word or by epistle. So during the first century, some of it was taught by word. Mouth to mouth. Paul Telling the Corinthians, brethren, you need to stop and do this. And then, then Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians. Sometimes he was there in person telling them what God said. And other times, he wrote the letter. Book of Revelation, the seven churches of Asia. He said, put it in a book and send it to all the churches. So the church of Ephesus could read the church of Pergamon's letter. And Thyatira, they could read each other's letters. Now we today can read every one of them. We have access to all of it. Truly, we live today in a more excellent way. How thankful we ought to be that we have access to all of God's Word. That we can be the perfect man, complete. Not perfect person, but complete. And that I have access to all of God's Word. Everything God wants me to know is right in my hand. There's not coming any more revelation. I, I can't cut part of this out and throw it away or add new stuff. You can't add to or take from. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. We'll be judged by this book. And we don't need it confirmed today. It's been once and for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. How wonderful it is to live in the time that we live in this more excellent way. They didn't have it in the first century. It's not the best. What they had was not the best. Having these miraculous gifts, that's not God's permanent plan. What you and I have today is God's permanent plan. They were in the moonlight era, so to speak, and we're in the sunlight era today. Amen. We can see in a clear mirror and see God's Word. So how wonderful that is that we have access to that. And then when we get to chapter 14, he's going to show the regulation of these spiritual gifts as far as worship is concerned, in particular speaking in tongues. But this morning as we end our lesson, if you're in the audience and you're not a Christian, what a wonderful time you live in that you have access to that which is perfect. You have access to all of God's Word and you can know the will of God and everything God wants you to know, you can know it. That doesn't mean that everything in the Bible is easy to understand, but it's there. You have access to it and we're going to be judged by the things written in the book. If you're not a Christian, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism will make you a child of God. Add you to His body, His church, and if you'll be faithful and serve Him, heaven will be your home. Be thankful that we live where we live and in the light of God's Word and having access to all of it. Let's take advantage of that. Read it, study it, learn His will, and obey His will. If you're not a faithful Christian, you can come back to the Lord and repent of your sins. He'll forgive you. We can assist you in a public way. Come forward, we stand together.